recording now, guys. We're recording. <laughs> this podcast was recorded on April 12th, 2022. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and people outside the binary. Broken class is back in session. I'm your discussion leader, Thomas Gradient Hiuda, and I'm here in beautiful Alton Baker Park, despite the torrential downpour that we're witnessing here, which is great. I wonder how much you can hear it on the audio, the beautiful sound of rain. I'm here with Aisha Elliott, the host of the podcast, Black Girl from Eugene. How are you doing today, Aisha? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me on. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Well, you know what the first question of the show is. It's the only question that I really pre-planned. Yeah. What's a controversial opinion that you have about anything? <laughs> and like I said, I, I have okay, so we many did fall start this. <laughs> yeah, no, I have so many conversations that could have totally popped up in my head, but the one that like I think is in the beginning of like everyone's mind. Well, maybe not everybody, but it sure. will be now. Um, Jada Pinkett <laughs> and Will Smith. Mm-hmm. My controversial opinion is that white folks don't have one. <laughs> so mm. in this situation, so I don't want. You said to me they shouldn't be able to really they shouldn't have their opinion put no, out there they shouldn't have their opinion put out there and really we're censoring their opinion like we do with everything else and the thing about it is is that like the way that i see that situation it's in layers and if you can't look at a behavior and find it in layers and have it culturally relevant and you are centering your own you can't it's a this very complex idea of how white folks see black people mm-hmm. and automatically presume an equity of of um, behavior and context and all of that, but Mm. then don't actually afford that to black people at the same time. Wow. So like when I'm looking at Jada, that was a conversation, I would say a majority of black folks, whether you agree or not agree, understood what happened right there. Mm. And so a lot of people who are watching and and then weighed in on it and then consequentially like have punished him for it in in a disproportionate punishment for what with the whole situation considering the context of the where he was i think it's clearly disproportionate it's clearly disproportionate and so it's, and it's they because made an they're trying to cover their ass because they don't feel like they handled it well i think in the right. moment i think yeah it shocked everyone it shocked chris but you know the i think it's more along the lines of like that was a white space yes and you gotta people have to understand what white space means and so when black folks do things anything out of, out of alignment of white expectation, then there is a there is this consequential backlash of that. Yeah. And that's what's disproportionate. And for me, in a black scenario, like watching him, the black community had lots of say pro and con. Mm-hmm. Yeah, pro and can, con. But with that being what it is, it wouldn't have been handled in the same fashion. The conversation would have been different. Mm. And I just don't want to hear white folks who literally... Like, not people individually, but maybe, but systemically, like, are the the very founders of violence, right? Like, the very, like, perpetuating violence as a, as a centerpiece of interaction. Way, like, layers to them to then st- talk about how a black man should then behave, you know, in their presence. It's a it's continuation. Just a of- it's a continuation. Right. It, it demonstrates how... Um, phenotypically and and cosmetically with the world looks different today than it did 10 years 20 years 30 years ago but mm-hmm. those st- same dynamics play out oh and, yeah and, and um for me i was thinking about whether or not i wanted to ask you about it aside from this uh, intro oh, question really? and the question i probably would have asked you was what do you think that the situation would have looked like and the media you know just all these outlets really taking it to the bank um if it was just th- uh if jada will and chris were all just um, equally famous white people. Right. Well, I mean, they, there's a lot on the internet, obviously, on the nets, that um, <laughs> that are talking about, like, the violence that has happened um, at the Oscars in the, in the past. Mm. And, you know, towards folks that we just kind of laughed it off because within that culture, it was, it's like misogyny is okay, right? And so yeah. there was a couple different scenes where, like, Halle Berry... Someone, wa- I can't really remember the actor, but he won something and he came up and he like just kissed her and kissed her for like 15 seconds, open mouth, like she had, and she went with the flow and then they interviewed, interviewed her about it. It was like, did you know that was going to happen? She's like, no. And I was like, what the, f-? like she was pissed. But we In front of the whole world. In front of the whole world. And she couldn't do anything on that stage, but go with it. Right. Mm-hmm. Same thing with Jim Carrey and another actress. Katy Perry did something when she was a, a, a judge on American Idol. She really liked the contestant so much who was like the shy dude. 
and uh, and like she was like, "Come here, come here, come here, give yeah. me a kiss, give me a kiss." And he wasn't into it, but right. she came and did and she did it anyway, yeah. you know. And and it's really interesting how now, if that was the black the, dude that did that. Oh come, come on. on! Just saying that you already go. No, that's not that's not how that's gonna go, <laughs> yeah. right? So yeah. that's what that's what the hypocrisy. I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot of hypocrisy yeah. going on. But I think that's my unpopular, like, white folks, like, obviously they control this narrative. They control mm. the space. That's why they get to control what happens. And we get to watch. And we all thought in some way that Will Smith maybe had transcend the racial barrier of dangerous black man until he's they the reminded him. Oh, yeah. I am legend. Right. All mm-hmm. of that. He's, yeah. he's iconic. But he's yeah. not iconic enough to get past him, so, him being black. So yeah, yeah, and I mean, how can how many examples can I think of? And you could probably think of a million times more of, you know, in this very park. I heard uh, City Councilor Greg Evans talk about how when he moved here from Ohio and became a, a member of the fucking Eugene City Council, how many times he still got pulled over by EPD, Lane oh. County Sheriff's, SPD. Yeah, yeah, you know, Jay Z talks about getting pulled over. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, Jay-Z? Like, you don't know who Jay-Z is? Uh-huh. Are you sure? He was doing 55 in a 54. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, he talked about it, like, in, in the last three years of being pulled over, and or, like, the last five years of being pulled over and having to, like, go through that mm-hmm. as, you know, Jay-Z, you know, Barack Obama. Like, these are people who, this is the president of the United States. This is yeah. Jay-Z. This is, like, he's a billionaire, you know, oh. <laughs> icon, he's mogul. And, right. Yeah. And, and that's, and so it's not... Beyond the black skin, you know, like I said, it's it's really I always say this in my facilitation. It's really mm. not about us, though. It's mm-hmm. not about black folks. It's about white folks who can't um, understand that the work of anti-racism has to be done regardless if black and brown people are around. It's mm. not about us. We're surviving it. They have wow. to actually undo it. You well, see what I'm saying? the zeitgeist, the cultural zeitgeist. <laughs> I use dumb terms sometimes. <laughs> Has wanted to equate it as being yeah. the the issue of black people. Black people equals uh, the sl- the struggle against racial injustice, and racial injustice equals uh, you know mm-hmm. you know black people. And, and one of the things that I see that is incredibly myopic and stupid, largely from non-black activists of color or people of color who want to be activists, I've seen this, and I'm sure you have, complaining and saying. When it comes to racial justice, why do we give so much attention to to anti-black racism? Right. And there's a envy and a jealousy and a weird, weirdly toxic like, because to me, I th- I think um, the black community in America, which is what I can kind of speak to, not really globally, or mm-hmm. well, I can't speak to it in general, but my experience as an American is seeing that it took in- incredible amounts of endurance, resilience, effort, organiz- organizing, talking, being arrested, being persecuted for the african-american community to get the the crumbs that Mm -hmm. they have gotten now in in mainstream popular attention and so to look at that and say that somehow that represents like a form of black i hate to say the phrase privilege Mm -hmm. that is so and i see it with asian uh activists i see it with white uh queer activists and, and and it's such a zero sum mentality that oh they have more of the pie now is it and that's such a weird perception have well, you seen that yeah uh, yeah absolutely but i you know of course a train <laughs> of course a train um mm-hmm. i think my my i would say that like i the way i teach this and the way i talk about it just in general and the way i see it in life is that most people don't understand how white supremacy works and that's because it works really well and yes. it's designed that way and so we with that being said, white supremacy culture, I'm not talking about necessarily the like the KKK. I'm talking about the fact that we believe, you know, that small skinny bodies with long blonde hair are like a beauty standard. That is a cultural norm that we've normed uh, that we have normalized even though the population doesn't represent that, right? No. And so that us you know, doing that kind of damage to black and brown folks everywhere um Having that idea and people saying not understanding what anti-blackness is, is like it's like not understanding that um, that water is wet. And the truth and the truth of it is, is that because if you don't understand the way that this country was developed 
and that when the country was was created in with the with the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, I mean, in that moment, mm-hmm. we the people, there was five hundred thousand slaves counted at that time, right? Mm-hmm. And the annihilation of the native, uh, you know, indigenous folks was was well underway, and people were already off the map, right? Yes. So if you don't put these conversations into context, it's easy to take it in ways that just kind of float the idea around, but it's very concrete how it unfolded and was designed. So anti-blackness is a part of that design. We were actually never yeah. considered, and we were never considered um, ever. And so, <laughs> right? Yeah. And all of the amendments Absolutely. that happened are just amendments. They're not changing the original policy that was to exclude not exclude black people. Black pe- You have to understand, it wasn't to exclude black people. We weren't people. We were commodity. Yeah. At what point did we cattle. become people? Cattle, right. So then you got to talk about when did we become people? Well, then at that point, it was about votes. Three-fifths of a man. We weren't even a full man, right? Yep. And so this, it's, it's super. And that was to retain political power for the it. South. Right. It mm-hmm. wasn't about the people. No. Or access or, or health or, or any of that. Wealth. Um, so I, it's, it's important. I'm not a historian at all. But context matters. You mm-hmm. got to know where, how do we get here? Mm-hmm. And so anti-blackness was, is a policy, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and black folks, you got to look at it in a holistic way where in the United States, and I would even argue in the diaspora outside of the continent of Africa, you'd have to like argue the idea that black people are the least resourced and that we have the least access to resource of anyone else at all. And that includes even the folks who were who are living on reservations at this point. Right. And the reason why I say that is because the being displaced yep. and then not having land that you can actually claim as your in no ancestral link. And that white folks in this um, white folks in this country actually have like empty burials of people's ancestors that we can't even trace back. And so wow. it's unconnected. It's, we're disconnected in almost every way. We had to reinvent our religion. We had to reinvent, you know, our names, yeah. our stance, our family connections. Yeah. So that being said, we are the least resourced. We, we are the least access. We have the least access. And so we are the lowest common denominator all the way across the board. So yeah, there is, it's, it's, that's anti-blackness. And yet have been the pioneers of essentially every music genre that, you know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, techno, you know, blues, R&B and, and, and a whole other host of other arts mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm not aware of because I haven't been taught about, yeah. you, you know. Yeah. And um, my, my father uh, was a wonderful guy and uh, he cared a lot about education. He was a teacher for a while. And um, one thing that makes me really sad that uh, is related to white supremacy in Oregon, Mm -hmm. I think. Uh, Well, ultimately what I'm trying to say is that as the decades have gone on, Oregon used to have a well-funded public education system. Mm -hmm. Oregon did. I know that you have generations in in this town. Mm -hmm. We used to have, and 4J used to be an excellent um, nationally acclaimed district. And, you, you know, it just... What, what I think of when you talk about about people don't understand anti-blackness and understand white supremacy, uh, I think it's so, such a tragedy that once people get to a certain age and they haven't been taught it in mm-hmm. their schools, it's almost impossible to, unless there's some like really well-intentioned person who mm-hmm. really wants to try it. Even so, you're going to have a hard time learning it as well as you would have if you developmentally had had been taught it. Mm-hmm. Now, is that to say that if uh, the Oregon public schools had more money, they would automatically be uh, better uh, at teaching it uh, about these issues? No, you have to intentionally have, you know, the right teachers and curriculum and 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 representation and a whole host of other conditions mm-hmm. that facilitate that learning. Um, but that is where I go immediately because I am an education-minded person. Broken class is the name of the show, yeah. trying to break down the paradigms of education and just this is our two-person classroom right here. Right, right. You know? Yeah. It's fucked up. <laughs> I mean, you know, it. to me, it's like 
it is it it is what it is, and we have to like stop pretending that it isn't, and that's yes. the part, right? Don't and so, live in a false reality. Don't don't do it, and and that goes both ways because I want to say, you know, black and brown people, we suffer from white supremacy. Like our internalized racism is deep. Yes. You know, our intern. I mean, colorism is a, is an a beautiful example right. of us not being able to see that that is a a. a a, a construct that was that was introduced to us, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the power, the, as much as we fight each other for access to resources, just it's it's not about us. It's about who's actually holding that resource uh, just far enough for us to continue to fight each other about it, right? Yeah. Um, and so I think there is, it's complex. I don't want to like simplify it where it's like, oh, it's no big deal, but it's so deeply ingrained in like like I said, it's like it is the water that we have to understand that um in order to realize what racism is about we got to know that we're carrying it in us we're carrying it we're, we're feeding it we are keeping it alive as long as we maintain the fear of like things that we just have never experienced like equity is something that we have never experienced so like when i do this work in businesses right like the boards and the managers and the people of power, they are so worried about what it might look like. I was going to say their ass cheeks probably clenched up. Yeah. yeah. It's just because like, I don't even know what that means. Like, what does it really mean? And, yeah. and that right there, it's not about like, it's about that, that moment. That's where your racism lies. It's in that ability to let go and find out what might happen if you allow a black or brown person to come in and lead. The fact that you can't <laughs> let go of the possibility of something else, right? Right. There's there's guilt, there's shame, there's like what they might do, there's fear, all of that. That's all that racism that's coming out, that bias. <laughs> and they're like, oh no, I just wanna, I just wanna, you know, make sure that the business runs right. That's still in that space. Oh, come on. That's racism too. Absolutely. Because you're inferring that it wouldn't in, in yes. the hands of someone else, <laughs> oh, right? God. So, and, and the fact that you would have to either share your power or follow someone else is almost too much to bear. They don't trust what's on the other side of that. Mm -hmm. That's race. That's that's your internalized and oppressed racism and superiority. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just like people understanding it. I don't think most of the people I talk to, and I'm going to say 95% of the people I talk to don't understand any of that. They really are like, so what you were, they didn't think about it that way. They didn't, no. it's like I said, it's like black and brown people's problem. Like if they, if you know, how can we help them? It's like centering again and saviorism again and not ever looking at the fact that they are the only people who, who actually benefit from privilege, which means this could only be designed to their benefit, which means who can actually undo it. Right. right. And so the, it's that kind of like lack of self-reflection, like I talk about this shit all day, I swear well, to God. <laughs> I can only imagine you going into these rooms. I cannot just, I, I literally can't imagine doing it. And I feel like I'm a pretty tough, resilient person. I feel like I'm open to having conversations that are uncomfortable and challenging. But for you to go into these places where people have such a low and, and non-existent baseline of dexterity around this, you know, it's... yeah. I, you know, I look at them like they just, they don't know. I look at, right. I really do look at, I don't, I take it, I do not take it personally. Mm -hmm. And I don't even see it personally. I see it as like I had a book that I had knowledge, I have lived experience. The, the reason why I know the white folks, especially in the Pacific Northwest, black folks, like I've lived all over the, like all over the country in, in Central America, and they cannot believe how isolated Oregon itself, but not even the Pacific Northwest, but Oregon itself, they don't understand how Oregon is so white. White folks will come from other places and be like, God damn, I've never seen such a white place, right? Absolutely. And so it's white by people design. From New Jersey or Minneapolis or They're like, Kansas where's the City? food? Yeah. Where, where's the food at? Like, where are the yes. brown people? They're worried. They're kind of like, did, is, <laughs> what happened? <laughs> what? Yeah. Right? And that's a good question because something did happen, right? Something was, it was in design that black folks weren't here. It, it was... In the it's in the Constitution of Oregon, yep. right? Yep. So that can't yep. that's the context. We mm -hmm. can't act like these white folks actually don't know. And it said, and we shall punish those who harbor them as one in the same. That's it. Just like you know. That's it. Nazis. And go back and check if it's still there. 
because it is. Mm. <laughs> right? So this the whole that's what I'm saying is like these white folks by design are actually ignorant to this to this information. Mm. And there's some people who are like, I've left and I've come back. Um, and I'm like, I don't understand. And people who have been here through our through our systems, through mm-hmm. our school, through all they they literally have not had this conversation. Mm-hmm. They're kind of like I always kind of wondered why I never knew any black people. I don't have any problem with them. I don't think I've just never <laughs> actually hung out. I've never seen anyone in my sphere that was not white. Yes. And that's a conversation I can have in 2022 from people from Oregon. There's lots of people from Oregon who have never shared space with a person of color yep. in 2022. Yep. So with that being said. Oh, they will reach when you tell them that, though. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> they will say, oh yeah. My cousins, friends, chefs, cooks, maid. Oh yeah. Yeah, no, totally. <laughs> we had a chat once about the wire. <laughs> right. No, totally. No, totally. And I and so because so since because I'm teaching, right? And I and I'm there, I've been hired <laughs> to teach and to give advice and I look at the situation being for what it is. They they hired me for information. I will share that information with them. It, it's always up to them how, if they pick it up and utilize it. And that's for anybody, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I can only give you the info. You can decide to, like, take it up, take it, pick it up, and learn from it. Or you can be like, that was great. Give me my money and keep on walking, right? I mean, it's <laughs> up to them. But I don't have a personal investment. There's never, in my understanding of how people behave and how people learn, I am not here to convince people that they're not racist because that's just not, that's a fool's errand, Right. right. I'm just here to give them information to consider. Right. It's amazing, too, also to me that with 2020 and um, the uprisings that occurred, uh, you know, they're basically like two authors who surged in popularity. Um, Mm -hmm. Ibram Kendi, who's written some great stuff. But then also I think the number one book was Robin DiAngelo's (laughs) White Fragility. and a white woman. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Like what an amazing... It's almost like, can you even believe this is true? But of course you have to believe it's true. Mm-hmm. You know, it's America in 2022 that that the best selling book that would come out of that is a, a white woman telling other white people how to how to look inward. And it's like, are you really the couldn't you couldn't have co-written this? You couldn't, you know, or, yeah. or somebody else couldn't have articulated this message that's been articulated so many times before. I don't know. You know, that's another unpopular opinion of mine. I think, yeah, for sure. It was very. um it was just like, really? And at the same time, mm. the way that I know white folks, like, to be honest, they can't hear black people. They can't hear us. They cannot see us for what we are saying to them when they have not broken down their defensiveness and their, their fragility. They just can't do it. And yeah. I don't see, like, when people are like, oh, the coworkers, we work together. And you'll talk to like a black coworker who then becomes a supervisor and they can never quite gain the power differential from their white subordinates because they are black. Like mean, that's yes. the bottom line of it. Right. Yeah. Um, white people are not prepared until they can see it in themselves mm-hmm. and where they can actually stop themselves from demanding centering and demanding control of the situation and actually decenter themselves enough to hear the benefits of having black here, the black conversation. Right. Mm -hmm. So there, I, yeah, it's terrible to me in terms of like, like economics to have a white woman, of course, then, you know, uh, benefit from, from racism. Yeah. Um, and slash. And I don't know that the white folks who, I mean, I, I don't know the white folks who wanted to hear it could have heard anything that we were saying in the first place. So right, those, right. those those two things, it's like it's like slash and, right? Yes. Yeah. So Absolutely. When you talked about um, Af- the African diaspora and black people having comparatively to other racial groups, nothing. Yeah. You know, no ownership. Uh, I'm th- I think of um, there was a, a limited Netflix series that Killer Mike did called Trigger Warning. Mm-hmm. Killer Mike from Run the Jewels, great Atlanta rapper. And he uh, basically had this episode. The first episode, I think, is called Living Black. And it was about... How even in Atlanta, which is uh, one of uh, the great, uh, you know, African American cities, mm-hmm. yeah, um, just for to to keep all of your dollars in the black community, yeah, you can't do it after a day of spending, you know, because there aren't uh, black automobile uh, manufacturers, that, and and he basically gives kudos to um, 
Asian American communities and that you go specifically into like Korea towns and Japan towns mm-hmm. and China towns and they have so much solidarity of being able to go to their own uh, nail salons and boba tea places and restaurants mm-hmm. and and auto mechanics everything you know and that's that's that that's allowed them to establish that resiliency mm-hmm. you know and and um, to not not be able to do that I mean it's I mean that's something that I would love to see in Eugene uh, is how can we actually facilitate black ownership? You, you know? Oh, I, it's so Eugene is. I kind of have a lot of unpopular. But well, you're also <laughs> piecing out. I am. I am. But so I'll, and I'll I talk gotta, about that. In I want to know about that yeah, because I could that. assume a bunch of reasons, but I, that would ultimately <laughs> just be me assuming. Right. Um, you know, Eugene is complicated because the concept of black community is splintered here and um the co- of what that really means and black consciousness is hard to establish when um there isn't a, a strong community and right. so yeah and you know and leadership here are older at this point i would say and i would also say a lot of that leadership uh had to deal with a really intense level of racism that I don't know. Like, I don't, like, when I look at it, I don't really know how or why. I mean, I do know. I have some ideas. But um, the community just has not been able to um, solidify in a way in numbers because black folks from outside of Eugene come in and it's so lacking on so many fundamental black statures of community that we can't retain people here and the people who we do retain here um you know the idea of black community isn't solid and so the black identity here isn't quite solid and so it's forming and Mm -hmm. and it's still forming and it looks doesn't look like anything else in the country right we have a really high population of of uh, biracial black and white children who are being raised by white families who again are from Oregon therefore have very little knowledge of black community and, and black presence and you know and so it it has a different feel it does and, you know and black community doesn't mean that it looks one way and I don't know that we've actually like grasped that very well within the community and we have a lot of work to do around that and so. Um, yeah, that's what I have to say about that part. <laughs> hey, I, I mean, it's I, a lot. It's a lot to, you know, it's layers. It's, yeah. This is an Onion podcast today. It's like I'm, Ooh, every, it is. every answer I have is going to be like, it's layered. <laughs> you know what I want to do, honestly, on a podcast sometime? I got to find the right guest or two guests or something. I really um, struggle to finish my literary tasks. Like, I really want to yeah, write. Too. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Uh-huh. And, um, you know, if you just get the right people and, and maybe the right subjects – you, I, I honestly think I can like have to hack it in my brain to where like let's just decide that this is a book. So we're gonna sit down for three hours and we have written a book. Yeah. We just dictated it all out loud yeah. in the oral tradition. Oh yeah. And then just transcribe it and edit. Yeah, that's it. Well, so I'm writing a book. Nice. <laughs> and a couple different things have come up like that. At first, I was like, I can't write. Like, I, I, I have all of this in my head. Like. What do I say first, and how do I start it, and what do I do? And then I got yeah, a mentor. The hook and yeah, like how and and I got a mentor, and it turned out I was thinking way too much about it. And so, like what you just said, like just talk it out, right? And so then I tried to do it orally that way, um, and then I saw that my thoughts were were probably just kind of meandering a little bit more than I would want them to. Mm. And um, then I thought. I could do both. So what I started to do is I started to write. I scrapped my whole first manuscript, like the whole first that I had been written. I, sc- I just threw the whole damn thing away. I know. It's wild. Oh, I got to keep it at least. No, I no. threw it away. I was like, <laughs> no. So then I came back and I started just like in the last couple of weeks, I started writing again. And I'm going to tell you, I got the advice from my mentor to start at a pivotal part of my life and to read other people's memoirs that I admire. And then just like that, those two things... Like, how did I change the, the pivotal part of my life that I changed this that got me to here? And then go back and forth and back and forth. It's a memoir, right? Or um, right. an autobiography type of thing, but more yeah. of a memoir. So anyway, I started doing that. And I'm telling you, I sat down and I just wrote like 10 pages. Cool. Because it was just flow at that point. It's like, I don't need to think about what it looks like later. I just need to think about from this pivotal part of my life, talk about that, and then 
then just keep going. And I just, I literally sat down and it was no time at all that I just wrote, wrote, wrote. And so I stopped at a certain point. I'm like, okay, when I do it again, I'm going to do it. I'm going to flow again. And that's just kind of how it works. It's your life. For my book, it's yeah. my life. So yes. I, it doesn't need to be, it's going to be exactly what it is. And yeah. like it's kind of like my podcast. You either listen to it the way it is or don't. And that's just going to be it. Hey, 1.2K uh, followers on Facebook. You oh, know, I didn't like even I, realize that. Yeah, <laughs> I looked at it, you know, like that's, uh, it's, it's resonated a lot. We haven't talked much about it. And so Black Girl from Eugene is something that, um, what, did you start it in 2018, 19? Or? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. And um, and took off, I think, pretty quickly. Um, but also with that, um, you were telling me about how, like, now you've got people in the pr- professional space <laughs> that are getting to know who you are by watching the pod. But yeah. you're putting on a very different, it's a, it's a very casual, you know, thing to be on a podcast compared yeah. to how you would show up in a professional yeah. Uh, corporate or organizational nonprofit space or something. So I know I just watched the mistakes happen. Like you know, like, yeah. Like with their decision making of like doing that. Like I'm like, why would you? So I but guess you know what? And I, not to cut you off. No, please tell me. F- one of the things that frustrates me so much because I actually you know I think journalism is a wonderful lost art, and I think uh, not that it can't be improved, but like. The idea that like us sitting here in Eugene and, you know, I got love for, for reporters, but these KVAL, KMTR, KZI, Register Guard, and, mm-hmm. to, and also Eugene Weekly people, so many times, especially in the TV sh- TV stuff, they have no idea what they're talking about. Right. Because they just graduated from college in West Virginia and they got, they got here and, 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 and a week later they're covering the Wow Hall shooting or yeah. whatever, you know, and yeah. they literally don't know. And they're literally speculating like, and the Wow Hall is apparently it's a, it's a historical and popular music venue. Like, apparently, like, well, <laughs> you know. Right. And yeah. so what I believe is just... You know, more people need to create their own media. More people need to yeah. share what they know about their lives, and and it's like write what you know when you're talking about when you're talking about literature. But talk about what you know, and and talk to people who are different than you, and who can share things that are that are different, and try to make it accessible, but also just keep it authentic and real. That's what I love about being able to do this. I think we're moving that direction where this whole like stuffy, you know, um, all white like way that we look at this is like really something that um is is fading and Mm. it's fading hard and what you'll see is like those folks who do that who will not who will not allow lived experience to be the the experience um it's it just like people are talking about no one wants to get a job anymore that's not what it is (laughs) that's not what it is people are seeing their value now right and they're not gonna let you exploit them for twelve dollars an hour when you're making the ceos are making fifty five thousand more times than what that you know like come on like i'm just you know exaggerating numbers but not really (laughs) right hey japan frustrates me a lot but they the ceo to average worker pay that's what i'm saying it's it's like seven seventeen to one or something when ours is like it's it's Thousands, horrible. Thousands, millions, I don't know. Fuck. It's horrible. Like, yeah. and you think about it, like, hello, we can't, look at the, okay, we get into economics, like, big time, but it's not about, it, it can only lead to destabilization. Over, it's true. Know? But look, look at what's happening around us. We are, we are choosing our own, we are choosing how to, we are going to participate in this community and how we're going to build community. Mm-hmm. And it's not going to look like three years, if you're doing what you did three, five years ago, then you're not, you're, you're lose, you're going to be losing ground, losing money, losing validity. Because everyone is starting to speak up from where they are from, and they we now we have the mics, and now we have the platforms, and now mm-hmm. we have so and more people are resonating with this, right? And yeah. so, 2020 opened up doors for people um, in ways that I don't think we even knew, you know. And the next few yeah. years is going to be very evident of the switch. So, like my podcast, yeah, having other people listen to my podcast in yeah. that way. Um, is different for me because my podcast is like, I didn't actually start it. it. I didn't start it as a podcast to share with other people. Like I just started it as a therapy session <laughs> for myself. Fuck yeah. Yeah, I did. Cause I would, I was recovering from being, um, assaulted by the police, by Eugene U- EPD. And, um, you want to say the officer's name? I don't know them. I can't oh, remember. Okay. I had a concussion that lasted about two and a half years. I honestly never remembered their names but um i would absolutely say all four of them because it wasn't one it was four so if i could i would but anyway the um the one the 
after I was going through that recovery, I decided that what I had done as a black woman in Eugene had been stomped on in such a disrespectful way. And that how, how I had actually like was complicit in that in some way, because I allowed them to quiet me down and go, Oh, well maybe later or we'll heal you later. You know, I go, okay, okay. I'll, you know, I'm going to act right. Wow. You know, that kind of thing. Wow. Um, and so the, the podcast was like, I will never listen to it twice because I'll edit it until there's like, hi, this is Black Girl from Eugene, and then that'll be it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'll 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 edit it too hard, and I thought, what the hell I have to say is what the hell I have to say, hell and yeah. whether you like it or the fuck not, I don't really give a shit. It's my podcast, so I just put it out there. So that's what I do, and then people started listening to it. Like it was my exercise to like don't listen to yourself again, and don't be apologetic for what you really think. Yeah. Put it out there. And that's what I did. And so for the first, it would just be me. And then it was me and my niece, like at restaurants and stuff. And then it was like me and a couple of close friends. And then all of a sudden, like people were listening to it. And I was like, oh, shit. Like I got like people want to hear my podcast. I did it every week for like three years until my mother, my mother died. And it, when my mom passed away, I stopped going so often. But I'm starting to pick it back up again. But like, mm. yeah, it was an exercise. And so then I created it as, as a space for BIPOC people. You want to come in and vent your shit, say whatever you want to say, <laughs> and white folks have got to just listen on the walls, like flies on the walls. Like that's kind of like that idea of like you just listen to what's being, what you don't hear. That was the, the the premise of it all. You know what's interesting? I've never noticed that you've never had a white guest. I have. I've had three white okay, guests. Okay. And those or three white guests are, my, I deem them allies. Word. And that's the only people, not just those three people, but if you ever see a white person on my on my podcast, it's because I have deemed them an ally. See, fragile, sensitive white people, you can too be a decent <laughs> human being. Don't look for <laughs> validation or reward and say I was on Aisha's podcast, so yeah. look at me. But yeah, but yeah, yeah. No. And and some of the folks were like, I had Lane, um, Lane County's public health department on my on my um, some leads. On my podcast, and there's white folks there, and I'd say one or two. I probably, I mean, they're they're good people. They were working for COVID. They were trying to get into the uh, black and brown communities. So that was like like those kind of asterisk moments. But with a personal like podcast like guest, there's only been two. I think white folk, maybe three white folks, and all of them are intimately involved in my success and friendship. So it's they're they're allies as far as I'm concerned. So that's how. The only reason they got on. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. And cool. they know, <laughs> like they're aware. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, right? it, it's your show, as you, as you can imagine. I I have days when I want to do something totally w one way with my show, and then a, a day where I want to do something totally different with my show, and it's my shit. So it's your I can shit. Do it. That's exactly. how I feel about it. Like you know? this is my shit. Yeah, yeah. It feels it, it feels good. It's weird though to have people listen to it and then try to decide whether they want to work with you or not, because you're gonna get like something, like you were saying earlier, like yeah. you're gonna get me being like. You know, today I was frustrated because this motherfucker here, right? And then if I hired, if I'm hired to work with you, I'm a, I'm a professional. I, yeah. I'm not bringing my personal shit to my work, right? Yeah, that's no. not what I do. No, it's and not. it's weird to me, but maybe they can do it. Can I ask your age? I'm 45. You're 45. You know better than the, yeah. you know, yeah. go, come into a space like that and trip on some. On some personal stuff. So. I don't do it. Yeah. yeah. And I've yeah. and I've worked for the state of Oregon. I've worked as in the medical field twelve years before that. Like I've created and ran two, three different nonprofits. It's mm. not being able to split professional and personal is something I can do very easily. I've learned how to do it. Also working with white folks, I understand how to work with them very well as born and raised in well, born in Eugene. Mm. So it's like I know how to do this, but I, it's the other way around because it's just like how black, fo how white folks see Will Smith and Jay like, how do you see me as a black person listening to me talk like that? If you're able to filter your biases and racism as you watch me, mm -hmm. I don't even really know how much you need me to help you out because you're doing <laughs> great. But most people, I don't know who could actually watch me and not put in a kind of a racist bias what the, what are they looking for? Maybe they're trying to see if I'm dangerous, or maybe I hate white people. Like maybe that, like all these, like I I don't know what they're looking for. Yeah. With coming into a personal space like my podcast, but at the same time, the podcast is on a platform where my personal space is to teach. So there's that too. So I I don't. It's whatever to me. I I'm, yeah. I do my thing. Yeah. Um. 
this is a, a silly practical question, but uh, for like my listeners who are completely unfamiliar with you, let's mm. say, and there will be some of them, yeah. Um, an entry point into your show. Do you have any kind of recommendation of like I really like that conversation or that was particularly accessible or? <laughs> um, look, I don't know. Just kidding. <laughs> my, I am. This is like what you said. Like I get on every week and I have guests, and um, sometimes it's just me. You know, yeah. and when it's just me, it's really just like me going, this is what I'm feeling today. And I and some people like that better and other people like my guests better. It just depends on what you're into, yeah. I guess. Right. Yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. Um, some of mine that are just me are very personal and some of them aren't personal. It's just me bitching about something. You know what I mean? Mm. Like that, to be honest, like I'm just venting on a microphone. Um, <laughs> so I would an entry Good. port a point. I, th- I do think going earlier is better just because you can kind of see, I think I was more focused on black, sto- like systemic stories than I am now. Ah, yeah, like that I makes have, sense. I think. Yeah, you come out evolved. and you're like, I've got this defined thing. We're gonna solve it, or we're gonna tackle this structural, systemic, and then you you get comfortable with it, and you mm-hmm. go on, and you're like. No, we're going to do this and this and this. Yeah, Yeah. that's exactly what it is. And so I think if you want more structural, like systemic systemic conversations, um, then, yeah, I'd go earlier on. Okay. (laughs) Yeah, because it started to evolve. Like you said, it started to evolve. And then I started to, like, allow people on helping, lifting other people onto my platform and be like, what do you have to say? And what do you want to say? And here's a platform. Say what you got to say. Like that kind of thing. So it changed from my voice being like, I need to let this out. At, and it transformed into like my voice and if you have something to say too i have a space for you to say it so it was different it's nice. hard to share yeah well so. there's a natural um segue into mental health that could be talked about when you talk about you sometimes you just come on and you vent yeah and that can be a really good way to get the internal like stuff that's floating around in here yes. processed and out there and even just the act of saying it and then hearing yourself say it can change the way that you know, for me, I, I, I experienced that a lot, even though I don't really do solo episodes, but then you're talking about other people can come on and vent as well, which mm-hmm. is an act of collect. Like, I think a lot of our conversation around mental health and mental health support and uh, recovery and rehabilitation and therapy has such an overemphasized one-on-one yeah. um, connotation in the in, in our culture, whereas yeah. group sessions and, and group healing are so important. So it, it started uh, in this way that you didn't know exactly where it was going to go and, and what the audience would be like, et cetera. And now it has grown to a large audience. Mm-hmm. And and uh, does that uh, taper its ability to be a little bit therapeutic for you at times with the pressure and with the expectations and all the chatter? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It yeah. does. Yeah, it does. It absolutely does. Because And I, and I, now I have a marketing manager. Look at me. Oh, snap. I know. <laughs> but I <laughs> Good have. Good for you. I, I have someone who helps me. Um, and I talk with her every couple, and she lives on the East Coast, and I talk with her every couple of weeks. And, um, and she has to remind me that it's my podcast, right? Like yeah. she, because I, I'm like, well, if I say that, then someone's going to think this. And if I say this, then someone's going to think that. And, um, and, and it's that constant reminder, like, if you say what you say, then people who resonate, like, you find your vibe. Like, I've, I'm my vibe will catch people who are vibing with me, right? Yeah. And so I have to trust that. It's that that whole idea of, like, um, it's that whole idea of, like, I, you don't want to cater to who's, who, I don't want to be anyone's puppet, because that's exactly why I did the podcast to not be, right? Right. And the more popular it gets, the... um the more I get where it's like, well, why don't you talk about this? Well, why don't you talk about that? And I will because it's affecting me too. But I have to do it in the way that I feel that's real for me or I'm losing the, the point of my podcast altogether. Mm-hmm. All, all of this means something to me, right? Like yeah. I, if I talk about Jada and Smith, like Will, just like most, and I'm, gonna, I'm generalizing like most of the black folks, we were done with it by day two. Like we were done. <laughs> we are like, okay, yeah. But then white folks are like, talk more about it, talk more about it, talk more about it. And I'm like, what if the answer is no, <laughs> yeah. right? Then it's like, I'm going to talk about something else. Um, then we, ha- then just like everyone else in capitalism, we have to, you know, is that going to make a hit to my wallet? Like, w- it will so-and-so not hire me now? Like, so you have that in the back of your mind. But authenticity in 2022 is where I'm at. And I don't cool. think it has slowed me down. 
it hasn't like me just being me saying what I say has been nothing but beneficial for me so far. So I'm gonna keep doing it. But yeah, yeah I absolutely have those doubts of like, crap, I need to sound <laughs> a little bit more like this. And it's kind of like, because once I do that, you talk to me later and I'm going to be like, what did I say? It wasn't even like what I, it wasn't really what I felt about that. I just said what yeah. would have been accepted and that's bullshit. So I don't do that. You Oof. know, yeah. in the rare moments I've caught myself doing that shit too. I listen back. I'm like, I don't believe that thing that I just said. I don't believe that. <laughs> that was crap. I was just kidding. No, like yeah, honestly, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't do it. Yeah. 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 Good. And, yeah. Good. And my podcasts are doing okay. They're doing okay. Hell yeah. Yeah. Um, Let's get to, uh, Okay, I, I kind of want to – I have two things floating in my head about your family. One is I'm kind of curious about just the the roots and the lineage and the and the contributions to Eugene because mm-hmm. my understanding is you go back a few generations, but I don't know anything other than that. The, uh, <laughs> but I also am also curious as somebody who, um, for what it's worth, I'm still kind of figuring out what it means to grieve the fact that last August my dad passed away. Okay. And so yeah. I'm, I I lost my dad at 27. You lost your dad at four, your mom, mom, at, mom. Four, at 44, I think. Mm-hmm. And um, that's a weird thing. So whichever of those seems like a more interesting thing to talk about. Yeah. Um, well, they're kind of mixed in. It's And I know it's hard. Like if you lost your dad, and I don't know what your relationship with your dad really was. It was but weird. It was weird. <laughs> Me and my mother, them. we have seven... I have seven siblings and we all had, my mom was really good at creating strong relationships with each of us mm-hmm. and then a relationship with all of us. Right. And I think all of us lost like our best friend and my mm. mom was really, we were very close to my mother. Each and every one of us was, were very close to my mother. Like, I don't know that any of us went a week without talking to her like yeah. ever. You know what I mean? So, um, we were just very close. And so, Losing her has been destabilizing in a way that I could never expect. But yeah. at the same time, I think about her life. Like she died when she was 80 and it was unexpected really for us. Um, and she died at 80. And I thought about like her youngest child. We were all adults. We're all parents and grandparents. We, we are grandparents, right? Yeah. And so she died with her, not only her children, but her grandchildren and her great grandchildren. That's beautiful. It's beautiful, right? And so that's I, my regret. My dad was sixty nine. He never had a grandkid. Right. Yeah. yeah. He that's will. A, <laughs> he <laughs> but he will. wouldn't get to meet him. He will. Right. Exactly. And mm-hmm. so that in that space, like I feel, like that's the part where I'm grateful for her is that she actually lived her life so full until like we were all adult. There was nothing left for her to do, really. Like you know when it wow. comes to like she really lived her life to the fullest. And so now it's our turn to like, to like, you know, carry that on and she can't be here forever. Right. And I, and that's the kind of stuff that I think about, but I miss her all the time. So it's very deep. Yeah. I am. Um, I'm talking every week. Holy crap. Yeah. Every week. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's why I couldn't do my podcast for the longest times because like she was my first Patreon. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and she was like every week she would listen. Like she would be on, uh, she lived in Costa Rica and with my dad and um, every week, like clockwork, they did not miss a podcast. And so um, from the very beginning. And so I had a really, it was a moment the first time I did it after she had passed, I tried to just do one and I was like, I can't do this. Like, where's my mom? Yeah. Where's my dad? Like, where are they on my podcast? And with them being gone, that it was just way too much to deal with. And so I took a lot, I took breaks after and she passed in July. So it'll be a year in July. Um, But yeah, I have my, we weren't born here. We're not a family that was born in Eugene. Sure. My, yeah, my mom and dad came here in 70, 70 or 71, something like that. I think it was 70. Anyway, um, and to start a free school, like a commune free school type of situation. Mm. And um, yeah, they are both from St. Louis. So cool. Yeah, they're both from St. Louis and they came here with uh with three kids already, you know? And um so my old the brother above me God, and I, I can all just I feel bad for them not getting the good barbecue and stuff when they come out, you know. Oh, <laughs> or well, whatever. You look, know? we had to make it ourselves. Is, yeah, yeah. You gotta know, like back then the community was even smaller than it is now. Like now I drive around and be like, this is a good this is a good uptake of black folks in the city because I see people I've never seen. When I grew up, it was either my cousin or someone I knew, right? Mm-hmm. And there was about four families, five 
fa- black families that knew each other. And we weren't, we're not church people. Like my family's not a church family. So, and a lot of the black families are. And so there was a kind of a level of separation there, but we knew each other because we were the only ones here. Right. Yeah. And so the families knew each other. Um, like I said, I'm number five of seven and uh, I mean of children. And so, um, you know, I went to school here all the way until I was 15. Mm-hmm. And then we moved to Central America. So my parents lived in Central America since then. So it's been 27 years since mm. yeah, they were um, have been in Central America. And they only came back when my mom passed away. So mm. it th- just recently how they've moved back. Um, and we talked about me leaving, right? And yep. it, it has a lot to do with that, that connection. And um, so, yeah. Yeah, something kind of has to be keeping people in Eugene uh, for them to be in Eugene. You know, they have to have a, a good reason, good anchor to yeah. to be here. Otherwise, there are there are places that are more uh, pastoral and beautiful and rural, and there's places that are more cosmopolitan and metropolitan that just yeah. offer more. And so, I mean, I'm very comfortable here. But are yeah. you? Yeah, yeah. My dad was like, we job we market about sucks. The, <laughs> the job market. <laughs> There's so much here that sucks, but there's so much stuff that's great. I'm going to put that there, <laughs> but mm-hmm. but I will say that like it, it's a beautiful place. I don't. I have a weird. It's weird. There's a lot of weird things that I'm connected to in this city, um, but like my dad was what brought jazz to KLCC for the first time. No you know? shit. Yeah, the Mims House. They're, now they're, they only play jazz at night. It's great. <laughs> yeah, and it, I mean back in you could go back to like 80s, and it's like my dad. Uh, doing um, his jazz show every ni- every Sunday night, I think it was. I'm pretty sure. But, my dad um, was in broadcast too in J- in Japan. Oh, really? So that makes me really happy to know there's a little lineage for both of yeah, us. Yeah, yeah. No, totally. The, the KLCC has been, you know, the the entry point for a lot of things that, that back in the day. So that I mean, he was involved there. My brother was uh, just transformed the NAACP nine years ago. Mm. Um, the he actually the Mims House was is created into a historical space because of him wow yeah because of my brother um it's crazy because i assume like it would like just in my stupid head i'm like does her family go back almost as far as the mims family no they just had a lot of impacts since the 70s yeah yeah no our family we're not one of the first five families here we were not we Mm. were in st louis and um and uh yeah but we've had a lot of cultural impact um since my dad and my mom landed here for sure like very, very intentionally. Do you think the NAACP here can get back on track? No, not with what they have going on right now. Okay. All right. <laughs> like, well, we don't need I to mean, talk about very, that too much. Very, very concise answer. No. They have yeah. to completely, no, this is a complete yeah. disaster what okay. they got going on there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Good to know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's so much awesome stuff I want to talk to you about, though. Really, there really is. And, and I always will, we, we talked about jazz a little bit. But I always go into conversations and try to get people's musical, like, what really lately have you been listening to and what's been keeping oh, that's you so inspired? Fun. Um, I was actually thinking, like, I need to listen to a lot more music. But um, I raise my grandkids. I have three small boys. And I find myself listening to jazz with them a lot because um, they need to understand their their uh, lineage. And so you start from the foundation with kids. Yeah, And so, like... All the kids that we've raised, and I say we meaning my siblings and all of our children together, um, they are they are black folks who can tell you, you know, who Eric Dolphy is. And cool. Other folks their age are like who? They don't know. But someone has it's like someone has to we have to be intentional about keeping our history alive. And my family, my dad and my brothers, they're really good about keeping historical um knowledge history and of like and always tying it back to an afrocentric point of view Mm. which is not my strength my strength is more emotional intelligence and how to withstand the ignorance around you and still be whole that's my specialty my brothers have um and my father like have always taught this connection historical connection and spiritual connection to afro uh afro centricity having that all involved so it's like this mixture so we have to, we in my family I'm speaking for my family we take that information and give it to the littles so when it comes to music it's like I start with like blues and jazz but me you know I'm I'm totally like Beyonce and Cardi B like I mean that's how I yeah roll. come but on I, I, I love invasion salsa. of privacy got that incredible like I every know. song every single song I like I just want to like just like I mean it is 
bangers. Top, yeah, it's ridiculous. From Get Up 10 to Bickin' Head to Bodak Yellow. Yeah, it's to ridiculous. I like it. Like, it's ridiculous. Oh, my gosh. And, and you got to, like, even if she's not your style, like, you got to give props to that kind of accomplishment. Yes. But, you know, honestly, like, I, I love salsa. I love cool. uh, timba music. I dance salsa. Um, I love uh, Afro Cuban. I'm, I'm, my, I have like 12, 15 playlists because literally that's how my mood switches. I love reggae. Like, like mm-hmm. what's today? Today is you know, mm-hmm. uh, a, I don't know Prince Day, right? Like you know, <laughs> and then it's like tomorrow. Who is tomorrow? Oh, it's you know uh, Charlie Parker. That's what I'm gonna be listening mm-hmm. to. So it just depends on my mood. But um, yeah, I'm all over the place like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wow. Um, if you were going to put, I don't want to say what's your favorite Beyonce album because t- for me, I'd probably go with the self titled one. But, like, if you, like, today, if you're going to put on an album, are you going to, which one are you putting on? Like, I was, I'm an albums person. You probably are, like, t- more than these young kids today. Yeah. But, like, you mean a Beyonce or just of anyone? Of a Beyonce album. Like, oh, a Beyonce cause, like, album. Because, oh, like, crap. Th- th- this yeah, is like Beyonce is someone who like already deserves to have like college coursework like you know <laughs> written a, a, you know classes about That's her. Funny. But I'm thinking her first one is called, I think it was called Dangerously in Love. Mm-hmm. I don't remember her second one. But then there was like the uh, Sasha, I am Sasha Fierce yeah. and number four. And then there was uh, the self titled. Then there's Lemonade. Yeah. And so Beyonce is comp- she did with the Carters. And then there's Black is King. Like I don't yeah, know. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, this is what's funny about Beyonce. Like we went to school like she's younger than me, but sure. we lived in like the same time that she lived in Houston. I lived in Houston. And oh, so there shit. Was, yeah. So there was like third ward. No, I, okay. I, mean, third I think ward, she was from third ward. Yeah, she's from third ward. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I and uh, where I lived was like very close to third ward, but not third ward. Tight. Right. But third ward is where the university is at. So everyone goes to anyway. Cool. cool, um, cool. So th- it's very common. I lived on the south side of town. She lived in third ward. And there's there's been times where where groups have mixed, right? Um, mm-hmm. Kelly and all that. It's it's a familiar. She's my age. Like she's a little younger than me, a yeah. few years younger. But we are like the generation. So I'm gonna say, as her albums went and she grew up, yeah. so did I. So each album, like the way that she created, it, it was the same for me. Like it actually was like life themes that were happening because of how she was growing up. I was, and I think I could speak for like, I mean, generally a generation of us were going through these same similar changes. Mm -hmm. So like Lemonade was like for every woman who's ever been heartbroken, right? And who has ever been disappointed and who has ever been, you know, yeah, abandoned in in any way. Um, And then like, you know, uh, Black is King is like the way, like just how I told my story, the way I've developed into this idea of, of just unapologetic, I'm not really catering to help what your narrative is of me, but this is what the narrative is, right? Mm-hmm. And that's how Black Black is King is for me. There's a lot that goes back like that. So there's like, I can't really say one album because where I'm in my life, Perfect. it's about Black is King probably. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, I really enjoyed a couple years ago, 2017 or 18 was the 444 tour for Jay Z, mm-hmm. and he came up to Moda Center, and I, I, I loved. I got the cheapo tickets, but I love getting <laughs> to be in the presence of who I believe is the greatest rapper of all time. Okay, I think when you talk about commercial legacy, success, mogul status, oh, social yeah. activism, yeah. hits, wordplay, and then not even writing it down with the yeah. pen, like. No, I can't imagine another person other than Jay Z. Um, yeah, there's a lot of talent. You know, there's a lot of talent out there, but, but um, I really loved that. And um, and recently I saw, um, the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Um, DJ Khaled was getting a, a star on the Walk yeah, of Fame. Yeah, and I saw. And, and and at first I'm like DJ Khaled, really? But you know, Diddy was there and Jay Z was there and they had his back. And I kind of thought. Why am I? Bu- why why doesn't it seem normal to me that DJ Khaled should have a star mm-hmm. on the Walk of Fame? Think of all the people who <laughs> deserve it less. Yeah, no, you know, I don't he's an know. Icon. You know, you got to pay to get that done. Like, you got to be able to pay somebody. Oh, really? Yeah, it's not like uh, I learned that, and I was like, oh, that totally cheapens it a little bit. But, oh yeah, I bet. Um, but at the same time, like, I don't know. Um, I'm sure I don't know what all he has done, right? And so, yeah, Jay Z. And I don't know all that Jay Z has done. Like we don't know how he made a billion dollars from what he's into everything, right? Yes. Um. So, you know, same thing with Rihanna. Like I think about Rihanna, like just oh the gosh. way that she blew up through Jay Z's mentoring. We don't know what they're what they do. These people are not average people, right? No. This, is, this is not like they, they're professional. They make it look like they're average. Like they make it look like it's easy. It's yeah. not that easy, right? No. And so, um. 
Rihanna was pretty damn refined even when she first came out. Like I think her first hit was Pond de Replay. Yeah, it like was oh seven, oh six, some, and she already just had a swagger and and it was clear that she was she had good mentorship behind her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jay Z like he saw that. I mean, it's yeah. the same thing. Like well, I, it was weird because I I didn't even realize. Yeah, I didn't even realize like Jay Z had produced Will Smith's daughters. Um, I swing my hair back and forth, and I uh, and I. When Jay, when Will was like, yeah, so then I called Jay Z to ask like, hey, well, I think we have this song, and Jay Z was like, you got a hit right there. It's like he went through Jay Z for his daughter, like, and I'm like, there's there there's levels of of like the reality that we don't even know what Jay Z who Jay Z is. Like yeah. we have no idea. Yeah. Like what he lets us see is what he lets us see. There's so yeah. much more. It's like yeah. the tip of the iceberg, right? Yeah. Um. And so anyway, I I just I look at that in a real way. And the, I wanted to say something about you saying that Jay Z, like the way he doesn't write down his rap, like he, like, it's like a top of his yeah, head. Yeah. I, I, I do a lot of my work that way. Cool. And people don't n- understand how that's possible, and it's because <laughs> it's like, it's so well studied and it's so um, real and lived time yes. that I'm not guessing, right? And so I don't. That's the same way that that he I, that I imagine that he is the way he explains it. It's like it's not, he's not making it up. <laughs> right? Okay. It's, just, it's like let me this ask is you a question. Yeah. If you're here in this space in life and you're 45 and you're in the black is king part of your life and you have confidence about what you're doing, which you evidently do, and mm-hmm. I really people are inspired by it. Truly, mm-hmm. hundreds, thousands of people are inspired by it. Oh, that's nice. You know. <laughs> yeah. Um, genius would you ever use that word to describe what you're talking about there like not to say i'm a genius but something about that ability to do it cognitively and would you say there's a genius there i think it's a maturity okay yeah i i do think it's a maturity it's because i you have to like to advise anyone you have to lean into what what hurts Mm. to see who you really are i'm not saying you know masochistic time stuff like i'm not saying that (laughs) but i am saying that if you don't look at your shadow if you don't look at what is holding you back you'll never actually understand who you are or capable of and the the genius part of it is knowing that you never do know you Mm. just have to continue to show up in your most in the most real way you can and that in my even on a cold ass day like this yeah yeah no like in my in my age what i have realized is that um there's a lot of things. One, I'm not that different, and two, I'm very different, right? Nice. And yeah, and and I get to perfect. That's it, you know. Yeah, it's that in that balance, and so yeah, I don't think it's genius, but it is maturity. And I and I have gone through a lot of shit in my life, and I'm gonna say I don't think I've I don't I'm not the type to lean away from it. I'm the mm-hmm. type to go, what just happened? Mm-hmm. How did I do it? How did I? What was my part in it? Yeah. How can I not do that shit again, right? And what do I need to let go? Um, so that I can move forward. And right. I do that every time. Right. Yeah. That takes time. Right. Yeah. And humility. Cool. There you go. Humility. You think you demonstrated it there. Um, I got like basically two last things I want to ask I, well, you. I love it. I'm having cool, fun. Cool. This is great. We're an hour and two minutes in. Thank yeah. you for this. Oh, yeah. Because we've never met. I love doing these with people I've never met. Oh, cool. And I like to <laughs> I like to believe that we get off on a good foot and, it's, and it has some of that familial energy even though... I didn't fucking know you until yeah. <laughs> <laughs> until you walked in here an hour ago. So um, I have a, like a somewhat standard final question that has to do with brokenness in society. But the one I want to get to before that is it's just a, it's such a, a weird. Um, I've used the word myopic already. Myopic way to like. I'm thinking about the U.S. federal government. I'm thinking about the White House. I'm thinking about. Um, the archetypes of leadership that have been fed to uh, American society. And the way I get there a little bit is thinking about someone like Jay-Z, who uh, when Obama was in office, um, for whether we like to think of it like that or not, I think there's a, a – is it a revolutionary level to, to think that like – for Jay-Z to be like in the White House and Kendrick Lamar to be in the White House, is that revolutionary or is it just optics? And so ultimately what I'm, I'm kind of trying to get your, your assessment of like <laughs> confidence in the idea of having a president at all. And um, like, do you believe that in 2022 a U.S. president makes sense? And like, if so, who would you, 
who would you pick? Like I, I would probably pick Nina Turner. <laughs> like if like realistically somebody who has the 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 quote unquote credentials to do it mm-hmm. and who has enough of a bold vision for change and ability to lead people towards mm-hmm. a vision of greater justice. Mm-hmm. I, I would think of a Nina Turner, mm-hmm. but I also think frankly, like with so many things that we've talked about, what is the value of having like, so, you know, uh, a woke person in, in the white house when the white house fundamentally can't be just like, you, you know, it can't, it can't you know, enact justice like in the same <laughs> ways that a community can or right. neighborhood can. Well, you know, policy is policy and, and, um, and we are like, so, okay, to answer your first question, like, I <laughs> I definitely, um, I feel like it's important, like, when you're talking about Obama and, like, uh, having a woke president, it's, <laughs> it's interesting to me because the people of color, it's only revolutionary to white folks. Yeah. Like, having Kendrick Lamar in the White House. That's why I was hesitant House, to say it. <laughs> no, it's only, like, white people are going, oh, my God, we are doing the most, right? <laughs> and black folks are being like, if I was here, so would they, they would be too, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's not revolutionary in, our, in the terms of blackness. It's revolutionary in the terms of white, a white perspective, right? Yeah, having a black person in the White House is a big deal because it's been really hard for, for – um, for white folks to allow that to happen. They've tried everything <laughs> to, to not let that happen, right? Yeah. So the fact that we were able to make it through the Hunger Games to get there, um, <laughs> you know, I would, maybe it's revolutionary or it's the fact that we have, we're, we're now, you know, catching up to the game. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Um, so I don't know. I look at it in lots of different ways. Like I said, it's layered with that idea. Um, I try not, like, I don't, of course, I am so excited about seeing people of color um, in real positions of power, right? right. Um, like, the president is a real position of power. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Um, a justice is a real position of power. I, I of course, love to see that. Um, and at the same time, I'm kind of like, it, we, it would be that if we weren't constantly fighting people who had had designed it to not be that right yeah i'm not surprised by it is what i'm trying to say like i'm not even surprised i'm not surprised by barack obama i'm not surprised by michelle obama i'm not surprised by Katanji justice Katanji uh brown jackson i'm not yeah we know people like this we know the capability we know our capability of right course. they are not surprising people they are. Um, I'm sure Barry Obama had people in his law school that were uh, s- smarter than him. Yeah, you, of course he you did. You know, that were black and. Of course brilliant. he did. That he talks about. It. He's like, I'm smoking weed. Like, I'm trying to do my thing. Like, I'm in law school. Like, trying to get high. Like, I mean, this is. You know, it's like we know who he is. We we yeah. know excellence is not like a excellence in the community is not like second nature. It's mm. it's what we strive. To, our par is much higher than wow. than white consideration much higher we know the 10 you have to be 10 times better to get half the but the truth of it is that 10 times better to get half the resource that's been for generations so excellence is not something that um is not just kind of like one of our tenors like it's like we do the best that we do when we're doing what we do right whatever you're gonna do be the best at it that is the that is you know part of black how we how we have come where we are you know what i mean yeah. so the people who we're going to put out front are the best of the best of the best <laughs> and we know that right yep. but none of us are surprised by it because we know where they came from yeah yeah so yeah. president um wh- who i don't know I, i'm just gonna be like i don't even know there you go i don't i was thinking about the independent i'm almost party. glad that you didn't pick a specific person yeah. you know because <laughs> it just know. comes with so many issues <laughs> right i don't fucking know i i i do think about like the independent party and like the mm. democratic party and the republican i'm like what would it take to like just split that all up you know what i mean oh I'm, and, i certainly believe in that in like freaking so many countries that do governance better than i do than we do in my opinion yeah oh yeah have like oh, yeah. 11 parties you know right. <laughs> like a bunch of parties right because you're having a real conversation instead of just it's just it appeals to the most mammalist uh mammal animalistic uh tendencies of humanity to just say the best way to win in this election is to say you could never vote for that guy. Right. It's not to say I've done the great stuff and you should fo- trust me. Right. <laughs> you but know, you just can't have you that choice. You only have one opponent. So <laughs> yeah. 
didn't you hear? He literally is a child predator. Like, right. or, you know, or she literally, and yeah. that's the level it's getting to now for yeah. like, for anything. It's it's amazing. Like you disagree on a policy issue, and they're literally saying you're a pedophile, and it's like, whew, I don't know. I mean, when I look at when I look at Katanji, like uh, Justice Katanji Brown Jackson, in a way. I see her, um, and I don't know her, like we all watched her do her yeah. thing. And there was moments that she talked about that were so fundamentally black girl in the middle of a white institution doing the best that you can that I think any of us who have been in a position like that saw a piece of humanity in her that wasn't, um, that wasn't structural. It wasn't p- policy. It wasn't oh, yeah. judge, right? Yeah. And to be a judge in the United States, to be the president, of course you have um, become very um, institutionalized. You 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 know how, and you do cater, and you do you have to understand white. You have to understand white supremacy. It's it's what you're doing. You're and part military of the military industrial complex. All of that, and that's why. <laughs> Which of course is white supremacy. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. I, I just umbrella that shit, yeah. right? <laughs> it goes so go to the root. <laughs> it, go, it goes, uh, yeah, yeah. And so, like, if anyone who has been in that position, they they are they are versed in it. They live it. They have to. But then, when you see someone who hasn't lost who they are in the middle of that space, mm. you're like, ah, I caught the glimmer. I caught the glimmer. They're still black there, right? Wow. They're, she's still concerned. She's still a black woman. She's still concerned and actually in touch with the black folks who are still within the, the consciousness of blackness. She didn't lose that while being ringed to get to where she's at. We know what she had to get through to get there. Who is she when she got to the top? It's the very few genius, the very few that make mm. it to that top and still can remember and, and actually hold dear how they got there. And that's why Michelle Obama is so beautiful in the way that Amazing she is. Woman. She never does not does not bridge how she got to where she is to where she's at. If you, you could ever get saying? her on your podcast. Oh my god. Oh yeah, like for real. You know, I mean yeah. she's got some Corvallis connections, you know, her, she does, her, her brother. brothers. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> Craig Robinson. It's so, true. You know. I'm gonna ask Yaba Blay to be on my podcast. And I just asked Jessica Lignato, who's an astrologer. Cool. Because I'm into astrology. Yeah. So I asked her and she's got like she's amazing. So cool. she actually is considering it. She's like wants me to give her questions. I'm like, oh my god. Nice. I have to get over the fangirl part. I'm not part. familiar with her, but that's cool. Do you, you spell know. her? Jessica Lignato. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, Lignato is like L A N Y A D O O. It's like cool. it's spelled like Lignat Lanyadu, but <laughs> nice. she's from Canada. Um, cool. Anyway, I'm super into astrology, and I talk about it very briefly. Um, or, like I just like will reference stuff on my podcast ever so often, mm. and having her on my podcast is just like I'm gonna try to keep my shit together. And she's white, and she's an ally. And she's queer, and she's dope. So anyway, like I just can't wait for her to be on my podcast. I'm gonna hope I can like put together a whole damn sentence, Wonderful. not just be like, "Oh my god!" Like, <laughs> Wonderful. I love the it. whole time. Anyway, so that's I great. yeah. So that's it. Cool. Yeah. Well, the name of the show is Broken Class, and I just kind of like have this cheesy way of trying to be like, this is basically what we've already been doing the whole show. But it's like I'll, I would love to know something that you feel is broken in society. <laughs> And uh, yeah. what might be a, a contribution towards a solution? Ooh, what is broken in in our society in the United States? The last, like my last guest, Jennifer Ye, we uh-huh. talked. It was actually the other shelter, but um, you know, we had a great conversation about a bunch of bunch of different things, and then she mentioned addiction services in Oregon, mm. and I'm like, amazing, so yeah. true. Yeah, we could do a whole pod on that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, yeah, we did talk about that a lot already. I mean, I'm trying to think of like something um, other than. Mm. You know, and it's uh, it's not popular because it takes time, but I do think that um, it's broken. We have we have gone so deep into work, like oh. commercialism. Um, we have gone so deep into capitalism. We don't see each other. We don't see ourselves as human beings anymore. It's like a this work ethic has become your character and it's like when you talk about how deep we've gotten to there's this crazy fervor from people who are pro-capitalist that the slightest kickback towards the working class is something socialism on the rise yeah and they've they've done that for decades they've boogeymaned that word yeah but it's amazing we so we are so deep in that that 
it's amazing how much that just the tiniest thing can. Here's here's my hippy dippy coming out right like cool cool I um. There's so much mental health work, but really there's so much like void in spirituality that we can't actually see how the everything can can work. Like actually we can't. Did I smell some kombucha on you? Or yeah, some, you totally some, did. Some no, <laughs> no patchouli. <laughs> Damn it, no patchouli. No, but <laughs> but everything no, can work. Everything can work. It, the the truth of it is, is that like when I think about how. Have you ever read Cahil, Cahil Javan? I have not. Okay. So Secrets of the Heart was given to me when I was 15 years old, and it completely changed my life, where I actually named my son. Her, his middle name is Cahil. Like, I was like, I'm going to name you after this dude. Nice. Anyway, he wrote two books that I know, Secrets of the Heart and um, uh, The Prophet. And Secrets of the Heart, there's this, there's this story that shows the, uh, the devil is dying because the... the Society has gotten to the point where the world had gotten to the point where it had become so benevolent that like there was no there wasn't any real issues. And so the devil was dying wow. and the preacher was walking down the street and saw the devil dying and was like, OK, well, what are you going to do? So when the devil and the preacher started talking, they through the conversation, um, they come to this realization that the preacher has real no no real value without the devil. Right. And so they're like, <laughs> it's, it's about balance and it's about um, how to coexist in this world of, in balance. Right. And that idea of balance like goes way back into like ancient African philosophy of Ma'at. And I think that if we can understand what it means to balance and that's like in every aspect of your existence, then um, it's a better way to obtain peace. So that's my hippy dippy last line. <laughs> It's very important. It's very important. It's so hard. And I think as a 45-year-old woman, I balancing is an act that you don't understand yeah. the, the what it really means to, to uh, give and take in a real balanced. And um, I, I keep saying this over and over again in the most authentic way. You can't, everyone can't be a winner, right? Yes. Yes. And sometimes the answer is no. Yes. You know what I mean? And that, and you, and, Sometimes the shit's going to be broken. You have to accept it. You have to accept shit. You know, mm -hmm. you got to be able to walk, keep walking, right? Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, you have to be able to recognize when you should stop. Yeah. And that shit is invaluable throughout, through life. Um, sometimes uh, what I... Uh, I used to smoke weed often. I, don't, I only do it uh, occasionally mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. But that literally, like, I, I feel like one of the things that I liked about it is that there was a childlike sense of wonder that it would bring me. Mm -hmm. And so I busted it out here. <laughs> because, like, I would literally think about, I would think about rhythm and I think about balance as two of the most fundamental, like, literally building blocks. Like, even, like, it's almost like proto-math. Like, because mm -hmm. math is, like, the universal language of the world. But like your heartbeat, mm -hmm. that's a rhythm. And mm -hmm. if you're not maintaining rhythm in your life, where are you? Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. you're lost. And so balance is also so integral to that. We have a we're bipedal, you know, <laughs> and, I'm, and no shame to amputees out there. Yeah. But, you know, we are a delicately balanced organism. Yeah. Yeah. And and it's it's one of those things, too, where I think we need community and we need friends and loved ones because you can't tell when you're out of balance and you can't tell when you're out of rhythm mm -hmm. so well, much of the time. You know, or as you're you too far gone. You can tell, but you don't know the right steps. Uh, yeah. As you get older, it's clear that there isn't one rhythm. And that's the point. Mm. There isn't a, a rhythm. Right. It's actually the there's a harmony and there's a there's a, uh, you know, in. The truth of it is, is that like you said, like you can't have a whole song in, in, you know, in a high pitched, like it, that, it doesn't work that way. Sure. Right. And that's the part that is the, the larger knowing the, is that the universe doesn't have, uh, this is something that my dad taught me very young is that, you know, there's nothing in the universe so thin that you can, that you can cut so thin that there's only one side. And if that's, Whoa. yeah. And so if that's the case, you got to understand that's not for one thing. That's for everything. And so that idea. He didn't know about Mobius strips. Okay. Right. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Right. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like this, this is like, think about like just the, there's a purpose. Yes. There's a purpose to everything on this, you know, on this, it is it this existence. And so with that being said, we are not, we're, we are a piece of that purpose. We are not the purpose. And that's the thing. 
And so understanding that how you contribute to the greater good is, is extremely important. How fun would it be if I cut the show right there? <laughs> it's been fun chatting with you, Aisha. I'm Thank glad you. you invited me. They should check out um, anything else that you want to talk about, like besides just the podcast or how uh-huh. else can people support you? Oh, yeah. Patreon. Oh, yeah. yeah, Patreon. <laughs> so I am on Patreon is uh, Black Girl from Eugene underscore one. So it's like patreon.com slash black girl from Eugene underscore one. That's a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I have like three tiers and one of them is like I do videos that I'm talking directly to my Patreon that I don't do what anyone else can cool, see. So it's cool. just like some inside information. Exclusive. Right? Five is just support for the podcast and $25 actually like I have, I make appointments with people and we have 30 minutes to discuss like whatever you want to with equity, race and all that. So cool. those are the three things I do and it, it means so much to have that support. So yeah. Well, if you if they book thirty with you, I think they're gonna want sixty. No, I mean, <laughs> you know, honestly, that's just like how it gets th- with you. So yeah, thank you. So thank much. you for your your love and your light. Thank you. All right, take care, everybody. Hey. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Great. Yay! I'm glad that was good. Yeah, our sore butts can get up now. <laughs> yeah, this might be one of my last. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thanks, guys. She said my head was so deep and I wonder how she would know cause it ain't dropped yet. He said it's better than he was expecting and now he regrets that he talk shit. They said it's cheesy, I said I'm a veteran getting this cheddar with sharp wit. I say I'm red as a laser attached to a head in a predator shark pit. Wanna start shit? I'ma say oh behave, you're not the only way. I got a one track mind, so every new song has a whole new brain. Voices and zombies say Tommy don't do it to him. You're an organ door, play nice. Don't you fucking shoulder as big as a boulder though, that's my New York advice. Been absorbing knives, stuck in my back, now it's cut up like 40 times. So I'm not 40, I'm trying to protect you like Esther the Mordecai. Suddenly sword and rhymes, I'm flexing and press when I say that the floor is mine. So on this chicken check and I'm a pepper and chef and you play me a short line. She said my head was so deep and I wonder how she would know when it ain't drop yet. He said it's better than he was expecting and now he regrets that he talk shit. They said it's cheesy, I said I'm a veteran getting this trending with sharp wit. I say I'm red as a laser attached to a head and a predator shark pit. I'm an artist, I'm a faggot. Flaming me, waiting in a dragon. Kinda hard to diss, I'm so magic. I'm an arsonist with no matches. When he has many white RP traffic, and he's spitting many quick bars, low that shit. I'm a redneck, a pro bassist, but nobody ever called me a fascist. I wonder when we all get past the law and division, cause we all took math, bruh. Will it be a bloody uprising there who would kill a mic and do to our masters? Will it be peachy in DC cause of Georgia and they elected a pastor? You pick some normal farmer when he's in North to steal in your pasture. Masters try to own the enslaved, now he ain't trying to own his masters. When your dance gets out like money, that's why I blew a roll for backwards. If a motherfucker said that I wasn't really doing it, I'ma work until my bone collapses. If you can't feel this in your body, then I'ma bet that you probably got no synapses. I'm on my god flow, I spit it up too. Alright, make some fucking noise, bro.